Just like uh, concludes general questions. We'll turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Jackson Carlow. Thank you. Can I ask the First Minister, which plan delivers public spending in real terms over the coming years higher, the UK Government's budget plan or the SNP's Growth Commission? First Minister. Well, let me uh, be very clear that as a result of the budget uh, on Monday, the UK Government budget, uh, the budget of the Scottish Government uh, will be cut in real terms by almost £2 billion pounds between the Tories coming to office in 2010 and the end of this decade, highlighting that austerity under the Tories is far from over. They continue to deliver tax cuts for the richest and just cuts for everybody else. Uh, by contrast, uh, the Growth Commission uh, recommends real terms increases in spending to protect our vital public services. Jackson Carlow. Well, if that's austerity, the First Minister is going to have to think of a new word to describe life under her miserable plans, because that's quite something. And whatever else that was, whatever else that was, it wasn't an answer to the simple question I ask. On Sunday, Derek Mackay swaggered round the TV studios saying, show me the money. Well, on Monday, the Chancellor did. And what the First Minister won't admit... And what the First Minister won't admit is that the UK budget has now set a course for public spending to increase within the UK at 1.4% a year in real terms yep. up to 2023 yep. 24 whereas the SNP's Growth Commission, their evangelical bible of economic misery, <laughs> forecasts public spending in an independent Scotland to increase by just half a percent. Oh. First Minister, those are the facts. So I ask you again, which plan proposes to increase spending by more in Scotland? The UK government's bold proposals or the SNP's miserable growth commission? Yeah. First Minister. Independence and control of our own resources, we can ensure real terms increase uh, in public spending. That uh, is the prize of independence. But let's go back to uh, the budget and the reality of the UK government yeah. Tory budget announced on Monday. Uh, that will result in uh, cuts to the Scottish Government budget uh, of £2 billion pounds over the decade that the Tories have been in power. Uh, most of the consequentials in next year, of course, are earmarked for the National Health Service. Uh, when that is taken out, and we will pass them on to the National Health Service, I should say, as an aside, uh, the Tories have even managed to short changes on that. We were meant to get £600 million pounds in consequentials next year. We're only seeing £550 million pounds of that delivered. And if that shortfall continues uh, over the planning period, uh, that will see the Tories shortchange the Scottish people to the tune of more than a quarter of a billion pounds. Oh. That is absolutely oh, yes. shameful. But, you know, if Jackson Carlow doesn't want to take uh, my word for it, perhaps he can listen uh, to the think tanks and the experts have all had their say on the budget over the last few days. The Resolution uh, Foundation it is not the end of austerity. Uh, existing promises of extra spending in some areas mean the Chancellor's numbers imply ongoing cuts in other day-to-day -day public services. Uh, so we know uh, what the Tories stand for. The mask has well and truly slipped. It slipped before we even got to Halloween uh, this year. <laughs> uh, tax cuts for the wealthiest. Yeah. Uh, and cuts for everybody else. That's the reality of the Tories, and this government stands for something very different indeed. Jackson Carlow. How miserably predictable. <laughs> Here's the reality. The Scottish Government will receive an extra half a billion pounds more in real terms next year. That's what the independent Scottish parliamentary researcher Spice have declared. Yep. And yet the SNP are so focused on finding the cloud in every silver lining, it can't even bring itself to welcome a single penny of that money, let alone half a billion pounds of it. Worse still, the Finance Secretary has also indicated that he will refuse to pass on tax cuts which will benefit middle-income families elsewhere in the UK. Will the first, so, will the First Minister today give any hope of tax relief to people like senior teachers, nurses and police officers who, without it, face paying a bill of £1,000 extra in income tax compared to those doing exactly the same job elsewhere in the UK. Will she? First Minister. However Jackson Carlow tries to spin it, the reality is cuts to this government's budget as a result of decisions taken by the Tory Chancellor. I've got the figures here. £2 billion 
over the decade is the real terms cut in the budget of this government. That amounts to almost 7% in real terms. The Tories should be utterly ashamed of that. But let me turn to tax. And, you know, we are, of course, seeing the true colours uh, of the Tories really highlighted today. When we set our budget on the 12th of December, the decisions we take will be driven by our determination to protect our National Health Service and our other public services, uh, to tackle poverty and low pay, and ensure that those who earn the most in our society make a fair and reasonable contribution to our public services. It will be a balanced, progressive and fair budget, and it will stand in stark contrast to the one that we saw uh, on Monday. But let me look uh, at tax uh, in more detail. Uh, and I am really surprised that Jackson Carlaw is prepared to defend the reality of this. Again, let me cite the Resolution Foundation. So these are not Scottish Government figures. 84% of the benefit from the Tory tax cut for the richest goes to the top half of the income spectrum. 37% of that goes to the top 10% of income earners. Oh. And then looking ahead, uh, the, and I'm quoting here the Resolution Foundation, the overall impact of tax and benefit policies put in place by the Tory government since 2015 will on average make richer households better off by £390 a year and the poorest fifth of households £400 a year worse off. Shameful. That is shameful. absolutely damning and shameful. And I'd be really interested to hear if Jackson Carlaw is prepared to stand up and defend that. Jackson Carlaw. Well, I'll tell you something. Audit Scotland's not very impressed with your efforts to protect the NHS because they think its current forecast is completely unsustainable. And what we get, what we get from the first, what we get from the first minister really is the usual basket of cliches. This was a budget which froze fuel duty, froze fuel duty, and delivered a tax cut of 132 pounds to the record number of Scots in work. It delivered a freeze on the duty and whisky, welcomed by the industry. Help for the oil and gas sector, welcomed by those in it. More than half a billion pounds for Scotland's NHS. Help for our high streets, investment in our roads. And the SNP response, an all too predictable whinge. How tired, lacklustre and miserable. They wanted a freeze in whisky duty, they got it. They wanted support for oil and gas, they got it. Yep. They wanted to see the money, they got £950 million worth of it. If ever Scotland wanted evidence that this is a grudge and grievance government led by a grudge and grievance First Minister, this was it. Why can't she for once, just once, First Minister, welcome it? First Minister. Well, isn't it interesting and isn't it very, very illuminating yeah, yeah. that when I quoted the Resolution Foundation about how the Tories uh, are cutting tax for the richest in our society while continuing to punish the poor and asked Jackson Carlaw to have a go at defending that, he just changed Change the subject. The <laughs> I think lots of people will have listened to Jackson Carlaw today and realised that he is completely unable to defend the yeah, policies absolutely. of his own party absolutely. at Westminster. Absolutely. Let's turn back to uh, the NHS and tax. Firstly, let us not forget, of course, uh, that as a result of our budget decisions uh, last year, 55% of taxpayers in Scotland right now pay less tax uh, than counterparts across the UK because of our new starter rate. Not helping those at the top, helping those at the bottom of the income scale. That's a progressive change. Uh, and when it comes to the NHS, uh, for weeks now, the Tories have been challenging the Scottish Government to say what we're going to do with the £600 million of consequentials that we were going to get in this budget for the health service. Now, we will pass on every penny of consequentials uh, for the health service to the health service. But interestingly, it's not £600 million that's been delivered. It's only £550, and that will cost... And that will cost Scottish people more than a quarter of a billion pounds over the period. But my final point, presiding officer, and the Tories might want to listen to this, because that figure of... £550 million has another significance, does it not? 
because that's also the figure that would have been taken out of the Scottish budget if we'd followed Tory calls to cut tax for the richest in this financial year. That would have been the equivalent of taking 13,000 nurses out of our health service. So this government, this government stands for public services. It stands for helping the poorest in our society. It stands for fairness and progressive principles. And what we've seen today is that the Tories stand for tax cuts for the rich and just cuts for everybody else. And Jackson Carlaw can't even try to defend it. Utterly shameful. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, the First Minister once pledged that in government, the SNP, and I quote, will not force students into deeper and deeper debt and would further meet the debt repayments of Scottish graduates living in Scotland. When the First Minister made that promise, the average debt for a Scottish graduate was £6,070. First Minister, what is the average debt today? First Minister. Uh, debt for students in Scotland is at the lowest level of any country in the UK. Yes. It is significantly lower uh, than in England. It is significantly lower than in Northern Ireland. And it's also significantly lower uh, than in Labour-run Wales. And that's because uh, we don't have tuition fees. We're protecting uh, students from having to pay tuition fees. Uh, and we've got one of the best student uh, support systems anywhere in the UK. And of course, in recent uh, months, we've uh, announced increases to the support we give students. So we'll continue to give uh, Scottish students uh, the best deal anywhere in the UK, and we will continue to be proud to do so. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, let me give the chamber, which the First Minister did not. New figures published this week show that the average debt for a Scottish graduate now stands at £13,200. That's more than double. Yet Nicola, Nicola Sturgeon not only promised Scottish students that they would not be forced into deeper debt, she promised them that their debts would be written off. They would be cancelled. Let me quote an SNP election leaflet from the time, which said that, we will write off the accumulated debt still owed to the student loans company by Scottish domicile students. And now we know, now we know, presiding officer, that Nicola Sturgeon did not dump the debt, she dumped the promise. Because this week, it was also confirmed by the Student Awards Agency for Scotland that the SNP has cut student grants and bursaries by a third since 2012. And it has increased student loans by a staggering 182% over the last decade. The First Minister was not prepared to tell us what the average student debt is, but can she tell us what the total value of student debt in Scotland is? First Minister. Well, student debt in Scotland is lower than student debt in any other part of the UK because of the policies of this government. Uh, Richard Leonard cites the figure in Scotland of £13,230. In England, average student debt is £34,800. In Northern Ireland, it is £22,440. And in Wales, where Labour are in government, student debt is not the £13,000 it is in Scotland, it is £21,500. Yet another example of Labour telling us to do as they say, not as they do. But Richard Leonard, Richard Leonard cites figures published this week, so let me share with them some of the figures that uh, were published this week by the Students' Awards Agency Scotland. Total student support is up by 4.5% to £882.7 million last year. Average HE student support in Scotland uh, was up 1.4% since uh, 2016 and 17. More full-time higher education students than ever before are receiving support, up 3.1% uh, since 2016-17. We paid out more in grants and bursaries uh, last year, up 8.9%. Oh. And the number of students receiving a grant or bursary increased by 2.8% to 
to 53,620 uh, from the year before. And as I've already said, of course, student loans company statistics show that students in Scotland continue to have the lowest debt in the UK. And my final point in that, we don't just have the lowest debt for students in the UK, that gap is growing year on year. So that's our record on student support. It's one to be proud of, and we'll continue to support students as best we possibly can. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, if the First Minister had read further into that report, she would have found the answer to the question I actually asked, which is that the total student debt in Scotland is now almost £5 billion. So the SNP in office has presided over a 169% increase in that debt. And let us be clear, it's the poorest students who end up racking up the highest debts by taking out the biggest loans. And that's not just my view, that's the view of the National Un Union of Students in Scotland, who this week said, and I quote, students in the lowest household income bracket still finish their course with the most debt. Even by the standards of this government promising to scrap student debt and then increasing it by 169% is nothing short of shameful. A generation of students have started high school and gone to university since the SNP made and then surreptitiously dropped their promise on student debt. That's a generation of students burdened with debt repayments that the SNP promised that they would write off. As a result, these current and former students may still owe a debt to the government but this government owes them an unreserved apology. So will the First Minister today do the right thing and will she apologise for her £5 billion broken promise? First Minister. Presiding officer, I, I think there are uh, students in Scotland who've started and finished degrees in the time it took <laughs> Richard Leonard <laughs> to ask that, that question. <laughs> Anyway, do you know, when I was, when I was pointing out the fact that students in uh, Labour-run Wales uh, have significantly higher debt than students in SNP-governed Scotland, uh, there were those on the Labour benches who were saying that's not relevant. Well, let me tell you what certainly is relevant. Richard Leonard is the representative of a party that, when they were in power, supported charging students tuition fees. And he stands here now and has the gall to moan about student debt. So not only do we have the lowest debt for no, students no, in the UK, not only are, according to all of those statistics published this week, actually increasing the amount uh, we pay to support students, we set out further plans. Uh, over £21 million uh, will be invested every year by the end of this parliament to improve the support uh, available to students at university and college. Uh, next year, we'll invest £16 million to increase and expand access to further and higher education bursaries for students from the lowest income families. We will increase the higher education bursary income threshold. We'll increase bursary support for the poorest young students in higher education. Uh, we'll increase bursaries for the poorest independent students in higher education. And of course, we're going to be paying uh, a bursary equivalent to the real living wage uh, to all care experienced students in higher and further education. So not only do we have a proud record, we've got the best plans of any party in this chamber for supporting students in the future. Uh, so we'll continue to get on with the job uh, and leave uh, Labour uh, to the various contortions they manage to get themselves into. <laughs> The number of uh, constituency supplementaries, three in fact, uh, first from Tavish Scott and Morris Golden. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, uh, Highland Sands Airports Limited confirmed that they will impose car parking charges on islanders uh, travelling from Sumbra Airport in Shetland. There's been no consultation, no island impact assessment and no uh, new public transport links between Sumbra and Lerwick, which is 25 miles away. Could the First Minister explain how, what happened to island proofing? First Minister. Well, Highlands and Islands airports have to take uh, decisions that they think are, are balanced and allow them to support and to uh, invest in uh, the airport facilities that are there. Of course, they should uh, do proper island proofing. Uh, Tavish Scott is absolutely right about that. Uh, and they should make sure that they consult. Uh, I will uh, ensure that the Transport Secretary discusses uh, this issue with Hyal and uh, corresponds with the member once he's done so. Maurice Golden. 
Cameron Barclay, a six-year pupil from Renfrewshire, is trying to study for his advanced hires. I say trying because he must attend three separate schools and because Renfrewshire Council refused to help him with taxi costs, he must make a 45-minute cycle journey between them that sees him miss both class time and lunches every week. Does the First Minister think this is acceptable? First Minister. Well, I don't know the individual circumstances of uh, young Cameron Barclay. I'm more than happy to look into that. But, of course, uh, one of the things we tried to do, I've had exchanges with uh, Ruth Davidson on this issue at previous sessions of First Minister's Questions, is ensure that young people have has as broad a range uh, of qualifications that they can access. And uh, some schools in different clusters will provide different qualifications uh, and young people will go to different schools to access them. So that is the part uh, of how uh, we deliver uh, qualifications. As I say, I'm more than happy uh, to ask uh, the Deputy First Minister to look into the specific case that the member uh, is raising. Uh, but the principle uh, here is that we want to ensure that young people get access to as broad a range of qualifications as it is possible to do. And Pauline McNeill. The First Minister is only too aware of the impact of two fires on Sucky Hall Street in Glasgow, where those businesses will be closed for months on end. Some are still struggling and sadly some will probably not make it. Does the First Minister agree that Glasgow deserves the same treatment as Belfast, who in the budget were awarded £2 million for their equally tragic circumstances of the Primark fire fallout? Does the First Minister agree that this is appalling, that Glasgow's needs were ignored? And I know she has been helpful to the business in Suckery Hall Street, for which I am very grateful. But will the First Minister meet with people of Suckery Hall Street businesses to discuss what further help can be given to the City of Glasgow? First Minister. Well, the Finance Secretary has already met with businesses affected by these two fires and he intends to continue to do that and to engage with them uh, in the run-up to our own budget in December uh, and indeed beyond. The Scottish Government has already provided financial support both in terms of uh, business rates relief uh, but also uh, in terms of the £5 million fund that we set up to allow businesses to access uh, financial support and a number of businesses have taken advantage uh, of that. Uh, I do regret the fact that I certainly don't regret the fact that Belfast got support. I think that was right and proper, but I regret the fact that that uh, was given to Belfast uh, and there was not the same consideration by the UK government uh, to the situation in Glasgow. But of course, uh, the responsibility of the Scottish government through our own uh, financial decisions is to make sure we are taking all appropriate steps to help businesses affected. And I can assure the member that we will continue to do exactly that. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, presiding officer. Later today, Parliament will debate the treatment of asylum seekers in our society in view of the continued threat of an imminent wave of mass evictions and mass destitution in Glasgow. And I hope the vast majority of us will unite in revulsion at the UK government's brutal policies and also in determination to take action to support asylum seekers and other vulnerable migrants. People like Abdul, he was refused asylum and has been destitute in Glasgow now for two years. He has serious epilepsy as well as mental health issues stemming from his persecution in Afghanistan as well as from his homelessness here. This summer he was discharged from an emergency hospital appointment to a shelter that didn't have space for him. As I speak, Abdul is facing destitution again tonight. He'll spend a yet another unsafe night on the streets with literally nowhere to go. Only once he has short-term safe emergency accommodation staffed by professionals who can meet his health needs only then can he start making choices in his life again rather than being forced to make the grimmest survival decisions night after night that provision doesn't yet exist and with winter coming it's needed now can the first minister tell us five months after the scottish government accepted the recommendation that there must be funding for emergency accommodation for those at immediate risk what progress is being made and when will this provision be available? First Minister. Uh, well, the recommendations that were made by the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Task Force, uh, the initial recommendations that were made in the run-up to last winter uh, were accepted in full and funding was made available and that funding uh, was used to very good effect to help uh, many of those who were facing uh, rough sleeping and those working on the front line who helped shape those recommendations, those that I've spoken to, uh, are very positive about the impact they have. Uh, as Patrick Harvey knows, there, were, there have been uh, further streams of recommendations made by that 
Task Force. They've now published their final recommendations, uh, and we are working through the implementation of all of those, and it's an ongoing uh, process. In terms of asylum seekers, I mean, there are, and uh, I'm, obviously I don't know the particular uh, circumstances of the individual that Patrick Harvey has mentioned today. Uh, often uh, with asylum seekers there are issues uh, around uh, recourse to public funds which complicate some of the, the provision that the Scottish Government would want to see provided. I abhor uh, the way in which the UK system often exacerbates the trauma uh, that asylum seekers uh, have experienced uh, and uh, the trauma that has brought them uh, to this country. I want to make sure that we uh, do everything we can to help them in the situations that they face but also that our actions uh, to tackle rough sleeping and homelessness are not just about helping uh, asylum seekers but are helping everybody who faces uh, that circumstance. In terms of the detail, there was a, a large number of recommendations made by the Homelessness Task Force in terms of the detail uh, of where all of them are in progress uh, of being implemented. I'm more than happy to get the Cabinet Secretary uh, and Kevin Stewart, the Housing Minister, uh, rather, to write to Patrick Harvey and set out uh, the progress against each and every one of them. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. And I appreciate the tone of the First Minister's answer. And I, I do believe that the Scottish Government wants to get this right. We in Scotland should reject the wider hostile environment policy on migration in general that comes from the UK Government, but also reject the idea that asylum seekers are a burden. To be asked for asylum is to be in a privileged position. To be able to offer asylum to those who need it is to be privileged. To have to ask, that's what it is to bear a burden. But we do need more than just that firm sentiment and the, the commitments to act. We need that action to be immediate, especially as the nights grow colder. We need an urgent timetable for the implementation of that recommendation on emergency accommodation provision and integrated service that includes support services as well. And we know that there isn't a legal barrier to funding those services, even for those people that the UK government has abandoned with the label no recourse to public funds. So if the First Minister agrees that no one should be made destitute in 21st century Scotland, will she give a clear commitment that the Scottish government will take the action necessary to prevent this humanitarian crisis on our own doorstep? First Minister. Uh, yes, I will give that commitment. As I said in my previous answer, we are in the process of implementing all of the recommendations uh, of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Task Force. Uh, we learned a lot from uh, the winter initiatives that were taken last year, uh, and those lessons will be applied this year. We are, uh, of course, committing significant funding uh, to this. Uh, we have, out of the Ending Homelessness uh, Fund, we've allocated more than £23 million uh, to get on uh, with uh, implementing these recommendations. We've also uh, recently announced, of course, additional funding for the Housing First approach. Uh, so I absolutely agree, and I would say that uh, the the, the sentiment that I'm expressing here in terms of the detail of what we're doing uh, to tackle rough sleeping and homelessness is backed up by the practical action we're taking. Uh, more generally, I uh, do not think we should ever uh, see those who seek asylum as a burden. Uh, we are undertaking our moral responsibility in offering asylum to, pe uh, to people here. Uh, but uh, I, given the nature of the constituency I represent. I make representations uh, regularly on the part of a, a large number of asylum seekers and uh, what we often find with people who come here seeking asylum is that they are highly skilled, highly educated people and one of the things uh, I believe very strongly is that they should be allowed, as so many of them want to do, to work and make a contribution while they're here. So I would hope that this parliament uh, on all of these issues can unite, uh, call on the UK government uh, to change the rules that are causing uh, and exacerbating so much of the misery that asylum seekers are facing, but also get behind the work that we are doing uh, around tackling homelessness and rough sleeping, not just for asylum seekers, but for everybody who faces that situation. A couple of further supplementaries. The first from Bill Kidd. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Does the First Minister share my concern that this week's UK budget was a missed opportunity to, roll, uh, to end the rollout of universal credit? The Chancellor's proclamation that universal credit is here to stay risk driving more children into poverty and forcing families to depend on food banks as the five food banks in Glasgow and his land. First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with that. The extra money that was 
announced for universal credit and uh, the changes to the work allowances within universal credit uh, would of course welcome, uh, but I don't think it goes nearly far enough. Uh, universal credit is still uh, going to adversely affect many people uh, and lead many people into rent arrears and debt that would be completely avoidable. So I still uh, take the view that universal credit should uh, not be tinkered with, universal credit should be halted and I, I hope this parliament continues to call on the UK government to do exactly uh, that. Um, interestingly, I quoted the Resolution Foundation uh, a couple of times already uh, today, but uh, you know, the point they made uh, about uh, how the income tax uh, threshold increases and indeed the increases to the universal credit work allowances, uh, that these changes do not offset the impact of the benefits freeze for lower income households. So it's not just about universal credit, it's about the overall impact uh, of the, the welfare cuts that we're seeing, uh, which, as I said earlier on, is leading to a situation where uh, the richest in society are going to end up better off and the poorest in society are going to end up worse off. Uh, I think that, as we saw from Jackson Carlow earlier on, is literally indefensible, and I hope this parliament continues to stand up against it. Alison Johnson. Thank you. The Scottish Government's consultation on the Protection of Wild Mammals Act ended in January, closed in January. Analysis of the responses was published in July. The vast majority of the 20,000 respondents want to see a real ban on hunting with dogs. The fox hunting season begins again on Saturday, yet the government still has to publish a response. Does the First Minister believe the Scottish Government has done enough to ensure foxes are not hunted with hounds when the season begins this weekend? First Minister. Um, the Scottish Government's response on this is due to be published imminently. I don't have uh, the date for that uh, in front of me right now. I know Cabinet is uh, due to discuss it uh, very soon. Uh, I'll ask Rosanna Cunningham to write to the member to give her more detail on the timing of that. Do I think uh, we've done enough? I think we've done the right thing. We uh, asked Lord Bonamy to review the provisions. Uh, he has published a report. It's right that we carefully consider uh, the way forward. That's exactly what we're doing, taking full account of the consultation uh, responses that we've received. And as I say, we will set out a response uh, in due course and uh, as soon as possible. Question number four, John Mason. Thank you. Uh, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to the reported rise in anti-Semitism. First Minister. Well, there is absolutely no place in Scotland or anywhere else for any form of anti-Semitism or religious hatred. Uh, last week, of course, uh, we learned of the tragic attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Uh, and my thoughts, and I'm sure the thoughts of the whole chamber, are with all of those affected. Uh, we stand in solidarity with the Jewish community across the world. Uh, I was reminded of the importance of tolerance, compassion and respect uh, during my visit to Auschwitz earlier this week with school children from across Scotland. Uh, I certainly will never forget what I saw there and none of us should ever forget the horrors of genocides around the world. Uh, they're a stark reminder of the inhumanity and violence that bigotry and intolerance can cause. Uh, we are committed to tackling hate crime and prejudice. We recently launched the Letters from Scotland campaign, which aims to encourage witnesses and victims to report hate crime and help to create a society where hate crime and prejudice of any form is not tolerated. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the First Minister for that answer, and I certainly share her sympathies uh, with those affected by the attack in Pittsburgh. I have to say, I also found the visit to Auschwitz uh, incredibly moving, uh, especially when I saw the railway uh, there. Would the First Minister agree that both the words and the tone that politicians use are extremely important and can have a big impact on the people that hear them? And uh, we all need to be wary and uh, careful of the tone we use, including President Trump about Mexico and other people about Israel and about the Jewish communities. First Minister. Uh, yes, I absolutely agree with that. I think it's incumbent on all of us to consider carefully uh, the words and the language that we use and, and the tone that we use as well. Uh, words do matter, uh, and all of us are aware of the damaging impact that can be inflicted upon individuals and communities through the irresponsible use of language. Everybody in public life has a duty to be aware of that and to understand the importance of the messages, tone and language that we use. It's important that we acknowledge and take time to consider the impact our words can have on people, on their families, and of course that includes personalised attacks and violent language. Uh, Personalised attacks, violent language uh, debases all of us, and all of us, each and every single one of us, have a part to play in challenging and confronting that. Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you. The First Minister has referred to her visit this week um, to Auschwitz. 
And in reflecting on her visit, as I have reflected on my own visits to Holocaust memorials such as Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, does the First Minister agree with me that above all else, the principal lesson of the Holocaust is that none of us can ever afford to look the other way in the face of anti-Semitism. Even in a country as otherwise welcoming and civilized as Scotland, as Ephraim Borowski of the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities has recently said, Jewish people remain 30 times more likely than others to be targeted for their religion. Is that not a call, First Minister, not merely for words, but for action? First Minister. Uh, yes, and I, I think all of us have to look carefully uh, not just at what we say, but uh, in how we apply uh, those words in the actions we take. And I, uh, as First Minister and as leader of my party, uh, take that responsibility very seriously, and I hope that uh, goes for others across the chamber. Um, I think uh, for anybody here who hasn't uh, yet had the opportunity to visit Auschwitz, if, if you get that opportunity, I, I would thoroughly recommend taking it. It is, it is a profoundly unsettling experience but an incredibly important one. And as I uh, said when I was there on Tuesday, it's important uh, to remember all of those uh, who suffered and were murdered there uh, and to pay tribute to that suffering. But it is really important that we don't just see what happened there in a historical context. It's not just a history lesson. Uh, the Holocaust didn't start in Auschwitz or, or Birkenau or any of the concentration camps, uh, the Holocaust started in the everyday anti-Semitism and discrimination, uh, the, the othering and dehumanizing of Jews. And that's the lesson that we must learn and apply in our modern lives. Uh, and that's why uh, I was so pleased to be there uh, with 200 Scottish school students and so pleased that the Scottish Government, as many members in this chamber I know do, support the work of the Holocaust Education Trust to make sure as many young people get that experience as possible. It had a profound impact on me, but I know watching uh, the reactions of the young people that I was with, it had a deeply uh, profound impact on them as well. But that can only be to the good as we do everything we can to make sure that those horrors can't be allowed to happen again. And Neil Findlay. I fully support the, the First Minister's words there, but this week the acting leader of West Lothian's um, SNP councillors and one of his colleagues shared and then defended sharing an article attacking a young female Jewish trade union leader for her work representing low-paid workers. The article cited Adolf Hitler and Mein Kampf. The author of the article was rightly suspended by the First Minister's party. Will the First Minister now take further action and suspend both elected councillors and others who spread such offensive, hateful material and attack and abuse people for simply doing their job. First Minister. Well, can, I, can, can I respond really seriously and uh, in a very heartfelt way to, to that legitimate question? Because I think it is important that all of us uh, reflect to uh, follow up on Adam Tompkins' question, not just on what we say, but on what we do. Uh, the author of that blog was suspended from SNP membership uh, earlier uh, this week. Obviously, there will now be due process that has to be gone through, so I won't say any more uh, about that at this stage. Uh, what I will say is that the IRA uh, definitions around anti-Semitism will be used uh, in the consideration of that disciplinary complaint. In terms of the SNP councillor, I, I should say uh, the councillor uh, in question has uh, written uh, to the young woman uh, mentioned uh, today uh, with a, an unreserved apology. Uh, recognising, fully uh, recognising that he made uh, a significant error of judgement and that that error of judgement arose out of a, a lack of understanding and knowledge. Uh, now, there's two things I want to say about this, and I, I was discussing these things in general terms with some of the, uh, the members of the Jewish community that I was with on Tuesday. Where people do get things wrong uh, through lack of understanding or knowledge, it is sometimes important that we give them a chance to learn because education and learning is an important part of combating anti-Semitism and tolerance and racism of all forms. Um, we, and I should say uh, the SNP is uh, responsible for the decisions we take on these uh, things and answerable for those decisions, but we in all of these matters and have done so this week have consulted uh, SCOJEC, uh, the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities, about the appropriate response uh, to this particular uh, situation. Uh, Second point, and my final point, President Officer, I want to make on this, is equally important. You know, I could stand here right now, and I'm not going to, uh, and run through a whole list of uh, alleged failures of Labour or other parties to, to take these things 
seriously and indeed to act as seriously as we have done uh, this week. But I'm, I'm not going to do that because, yes, in a democracy, it is really important that we hold each other to account, that we check each other's behaviour and call out unacceptable behaviour. That is a vital part of our democratic process. But, you know, I think it's equally important that, and we're all guilty of this sometimes, but it's equally important that we don't rush to weaponise these things against each other uh, for petty party political reasons. Because on the fundamentals of this, on the fundamentals of this, it is actually really important that we stand united to say that anti-Semitism, racism, bigotry, intolerance in any form is completely unacceptable. And the SNP will continue to treat it in that way and we'll be continue to be answerable for the, the decisions that we make. Uh, but ultimately, on these issues, I think there's a lot more than, that unites all of us than divides us. And I think we would probably do a greater service to the memory of uh, those we've just been discussing, but also to future generations, if we actually took the time to stand in solidarity on these issues uh, as much as we uh, choose to divide. Question number five, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that there is mental health support for college and university students. First Minister. Every student should have access to emotional and mental health and wellbeing support. That's why our programme for government includes a commitment to provide more than 80 additional counsellors in colleges and universities over the next four years with an investment of around £20 million. We're also supporting NUS Scotland's Think Positive project, which aims to find ways to support students experiencing mental ill health, tackle stigma and discrimination and promote wellbeing. Uh, and we'll continue to work closely with the university and college sectors, NUS Scotland and other partners on the implementation of the additional counsellors and to ensure an integrated and wraparound approach to student wellbeing in both higher and further education. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you. Thank the First Minister for that answer. She will be aware of the number of university stu students in Scotland seeking support for mental health issues has increased by two thirds over five years. Information from universities across Scotland for the numbers of students seeking some form of support found that 11,700 students asked for help in 1670 compared to 7,000 in 1213. Cases ranged from anxiety to depression, gender-based violence and body dysmorphia. Therefore, can I ask the First Minister how she plans to ensure that mental health funding is split across colleges and universities fairly and when, as she has just uh, indicated, there is some implementation going on, can the students expect to see more counsellors on the campuses? First Minister. Well, the, the short answer to, to that important question is uh, yes. The announcement we made in the programme for government, and obviously there'll be more details of this around uh, our budget in a few weeks' time, uh, is uh, that we're going to uh, invest significantly in putting additional counsellors into schools and also into colleges uh, and universities, and that will have an impact on campuses across the country. Um, Rachel Hamilton talked about the increase in students coming forward uh, for support, and she's absolutely right to do so. That, of course, reflects an increase across society in people coming forward for support uh, with mental health issues. And uh, as I've said many, many times before, that in some ways is something we should welcome because it is a sign that the stigma associated with mental health is reducing, but it puts a responsibility on government's shoulders to make sure that the services are there. Uh, as well as investing more, uh, we need to uh, refigure, uh, reconfigure uh, rather the way in which mental health services are delivered, uh, having much more preventative support, much more support in places like schools, colleges and universities, uh, in police stations, for example, uh, in GP uh, services. That's exactly what we are uh, trying to do. Uh, perhaps one of the most in, important uh, things that we're going to be doing uh, as we implement uh, these plans is developing the community mental wellbeing service, which uh, will cater for uh, everybody in the 5 to 24-year-old mm. Uh, age group. So there's a whole range of things that it's important we take forward and we're committed uh, to continuing to do so. Question number six, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what recent discussions the Scottish Government has had with the European Commission regarding the Highlands Islands exemption from the air departure tax. First Minister. But we want to protect the existing Highlands and Islands exemption from the air departure tax. We've written to the UK government asking them to notify the exemption for approval to the European Commission and have had ongoing discussions with them in this matter. As the EU member state, only the UK government can engage with the European Commission to pursue this notification. 
However, as has previously been set out, notification is only one avenue. We're also continuing to explore a range of different options to try and find the best possible solution to the Highlands and Islands exemption issue. And of course, this needs to be resolved before EDT can be introduced in Scotland. David Stewart. Uh, I thank the First Minister for her answer. The, the First Minister will be well aware of the calls from some quarters of the aviation industry south of the Highland Line to kill off the exemption with potential damaging consequences for businesses and communities across my region. Can the First Minister give Parliament an absolute assurance today she will resist these misguided demands and protect the interests of the Highlands Islands by preserving this vitally important exemption? First Minister. Well, it's, it's not just that I can give an assurance of that. Uh, the actions we've taken today demonstrate that we are absolutely determined to protect the Highlands and Islands exemption. You know, we have taken the decision that ADT <coughs> cannot be introduced and some of the policy changes we want to make can't then therefore happen until we've resolved this issue of the exemption. So we continue uh, to take uh, steps to try to get the UK government to come up uh, with us uh, with the solutions to this issue. I, uh, unlike, I, I don't know who exactly uh, David Stewart is quoting, but I certainly would not support anybody who wanted to kill off the exemption. Uh, we understand that that exemption is important for the economy and connectivity of the Highlands and Islands, and that's why uh, we're taking the action that we are to try to protect it. Question number seven, Mike Rumbles. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in light of ScotRail's performance falling to its lowest level since the current franchise began. First Minister. Well, I am uh, fully aware of the performance issues that ScotRail uh, requires to address. However, the most recent punctuality statistics were impacted significantly by the severe weather seen during Storm Alley. This, of course, included damage to overhead power lines and trees falling onto tracks. Uh, notwithstanding these issues, we continue to impress upon senior management of Network Rail the need for a renewed focus on maintaining the network infrastructure in Scotland, uh, and that will help ScotRail to meet its challenging but achievable targets. Uh, Michael Matheson is due to meet Sir Peter Hendy, uh, Chair of Network Rail and the Scott Rail Alliance separately over the next week and he'll be making it clear uh, that it is uh, absolutely imperative that performance improves swiftly and effectively to the standards expected by passengers. Uh, of course, this process would be helped by the full devolution of Network Rail, uh, a move that would allow the appropriate parliamentary oversight to be put on the whole of the rail infrastructure in Scotland rather than just on part of it. Yeah. Mike Rumbles. More services are running late. Carriages are jam-packed because the new fleets are well behind schedule and Scott Rail's performance, quite frankly, stinks. And now that is being taken to an all too literal level. This week, we learned Scott Rail will be dumping human waste on tracks thanks to the rollout of trains that first entered service in the 1970s. Scott Rail calls these trains classic. Is that the description the First Minister would use and does she think this practice is acceptable in a 21st century rail system? First Minister. Uh, it's not a practice that uh, we support, and Scott Rail have also uh, said that it's not one uh, they want to see continue. Uh, it's an interim measure, it is regrettable, uh, and Scott Rail are working uh, to mitigate the issue as soon as uh, possible. Uh, the Scottish Government, of course, has directly funded previous installation programmes to eradicate that practice across Scott Rail uh, fleets. Um, it will be necessary to introduce some unrefurbished high-speed trains into the service for an interim uh, period, but it is important that Scott Rail works to resolve that uh, as quickly as possible. In terms of the wider uh, performance issues, uh, it is important, uh, notwithstanding what I said in my initial answer, to, to stress that uh, nearly 90 out of 100 trains arrive within uh, the recognised punctuality measure. The latest figures uh, showed ScotRail's public performance measure at 87.7%, which is above the GP average of 85.8%. Uh, and the figures in the last period were affected, as I said, by uh, Storm Alley and the severe weather that came uh, with that. Uh, my final point is, again, the one I made. More than half of uh, the delays on ScotRail trains uh, are, are to do with network rail infrastructure. Now, we continue to work hard with network rail uh, to try to resolve that. We fund uh, network rail's operations in Scotland, uh, but it would help this if we got the whole chamber to get behind yeah. the calls for network rail yeah. to be properly devolved so that we could ensure that scrutiny and oversight of the whole of the rail infrastructure. And I hope that's something Mike Rumbles will support. 
Thank you very much. That concludes the First Minister's questions. I would just note that there was a large number of members who asked, wanted to ask supplementaries who didn't get in today. I would just again call on members and ministers for short questions and short answers. We're now going to move to members' business uh, in the name of Ruth Maguire. But before we do so, we'll have a short suspension to allow the gallery to clear and for new guests to arrive and for the ministers to change seats.